So it's been one year since I started my interview coaching side business. And one of the most common questions that I get from anyone, whether that's my clients or my audience, is what does it take to succeed at the coding interview? Most people believe that the answer is about knowing as much information as possible, but 99% of the time, it all boils down to how you practice. The better you practice, the better your results will be. If you're new to the channel, hi, my name is Edward. I am an ex Apple senior engineer at Uber. And as a side business, I help people nail their coding interviews. Today, I'll discuss my observations with people I coach for the coding interview and what I found works, what doesn't, and how I use that to approach my coaching business and philosophy. And the feedback that I have been given has resulted in great success. I've coached 50 clients so far, and out of every single attempt that they have ever made at an interview, 75% of those attempts have resulted in job offers, with 70% of those offers being in Fang M. So I've distilled the information down to five quick tips that I apply to most of my clients. And if you follow these tips yourself, you can nail your own coding interviews as well. So make sure to like, subscribe, and watch this until the very end. And with that, let's begin. Now my first tip is to focus on mastering a few topics at a time. The saying that practice makes perfect is absolutely true. Getting good at anything requires absolute obsession and doing things over and over and over again until you're great at it. A candidate who focuses on mastering 100 lead code questions very well will fare better than someone who mindlessly does 400 questions poorly because the guy randomly spamming questions will not learn anything or change anything about their understanding and therefore will not improve or understand any of the nuances or details. Let me give you a solid example, recursion. In one of my live streams, one of my clients was not able to practice successfully or in a focused manner outside of our coaching sessions. He would jump around from topic to topic and end up unable to properly execute on recursive problems. By the way, if you don't know, I regularly stream my coaching sessions. When it comes to the interview, you cannot afford to reinvent the wheel from the ground up. For a lot of these mechanics like recursion, stacks, trees, whatever, you can practice and master these outside of the actual interview. That way, when it comes time for the actual interview, you know these templates raw and hard and fast. That way, you can focus on figuring out what you need to know and extracting details from the actual problem itself, rather than trying to figure out some basic mechanic, something that you could have mastered outside of the interview question. On top of that, having a good consistent problem solving technique is very key to being able to land offers consistently. That is on top of the basic knowledge that you are expected to have of these data structures and algorithms. Not to mention, these topics build on top of one another. Without understanding recursion properly, you cannot understand dynamic programming, which in essence is just recursion with memoization. That is why I force my clients to keep a practice sheet and work with them to create a study schedule with very limited topics. That way, they are more likely to focus on practicing a few topics instead of working on too many problems and topics at once. Not to mention, I apply this to myself. I heavily focus on only a few clients at a time and make them my top priority. In fact, I only keep two long-term clients at any given moment. It allows me to focus entirely on their needs and check in with them regularly in order to track their progress. I can dedicate all my attention onto the needs of a select few and give them the best possible results, whether that is giving them different problems, changing up their homework, adjusting based on some random life event that may interfere with our study schedule. It doesn't matter. What matters is that I am actually able to adjust all my demands and expectations to meet their needs in order to bring out the best results. Now, the second tip is to take notes during problem solving. It's meaningless to practice problems without looking back at your work and trying to figure out how to do it better. Understanding what to look for in a problem and being able to extract key characteristics from them is a skill that only gets trained by optimizing on your thought process. The thought process that took you from the start of the problem to the solution. And the faster and more efficient you get at it, the better your problem solving overall will be. Because chances are, the key principles and characteristics that you've seen in one problem will applied to another. That is why I make people take notes of their problem solving, how long it took, the key to solving the problem, and what they could have done to make things better. Maybe they took too long on meaningless questions that went nowhere, or maybe they needed to figure out how to solve the problem faster without sacrificing their safeguards. What inefficiencies did they encounter? Did they apply a solution that they thought would work, but was actually for a different problem? And I'll throw an example on screen. Here is a log of one of my clients. He records how many hours he works on a problem, what topic he focuses on, and what section he is currently working on. 
he records what problems he skipped and why he wasn't able to solve them. So he records both his successes and failures. This is excellent because he can actually see the progress that he has made and how he can improve on his inefficiencies. On top of that, looking back on how far you have come is excellent motivation. In two weeks and less than 40 hours of practice a week, he was able to accomplish more than what he was able to accomplish on his own in two years. And I attribute this highly to simply just taking notes and looking back on your past mistakes. And while we might hand wave these efforts in our mind simply by saying, oh, I'll remember the next time, the fact of the matter is that what does not get written does not improve. Now, the third tip is to set yourself up for success. Code fundamentally is a liability and thinking in code quickly devolves into a complex mess of managing and juggling variables and codependent logic. Most people who get into this state are unable to not only debug their own code, but also forget the original logic driving the code. We want to avoid this scenario that if something goes wrong, we shouldn't have to evaluate the entire logic and code just to fix one bug. In fact, if we understand our code correctly and our idea correctly, the bug should be very, very evident to us in almost one pass. Code is just an implementation of an idea. And the stronger your idea is, the better basis you will have for writing code. By properly designing an algorithm with shapes and simple human language, it is easier to manipulate this, plan, and change things if you make a mistake. After all, what's easier? To draw and erase some arrows, or to copy paste blocks of code around and make sure the logic is still sound. I see here that I'm going to traverse into the node left, which is two. I'm going to push another function call to the stack here and use two as my identifier because this is a value that's unique to the node that I'm looking at. So back to the top of the function call. If the node is equal to null, return. Well, the value of the node is not null. Counter counter is going to be plus plus. So now this value would go from one to two. Perfect. The additional benefit is that it makes it easier to communicate with the interviewer. People really forget that in order to communicate well, there needs to be an idea worth communicating, something of value underneath all those words. Talking for the sake of talking is absolutely pointless. A picture is worth a thousand words though. And you'll be amazed at how many details you overlooked simply by drawing something out or by running through an example. This is why I highly advocate for designing and writing pseudocode of a problem before even writing the actual code. By being very cautious and very deliberate with every single step, you set yourself up for success on the next one. Drawing a diagram makes writing the pseudocode easier. Writing the pseudocode makes writing the actual code itself easier. On each step of the way, you communicate to the interviewer what your intentions are. I believe that each step should make writing the final code easier to write and harder to mess up by giving yourself good guardrails and support to reduce subsequent mistakes because the strategy and approach you take to the problem can be controlled, practiced, and refined. But when it comes time to actually doing the interview, when you walk out to that company and you're greeted by the interviewer, your ability to actually execute can be a little more varied. You might not have gotten a good amount of sleep, so maybe you don't even remember how to reverse a linked list. But if you have practiced a good, simple, clean problem solving strategy that you can use to derive any answer and that you can do in your sleep, it will be much harder to actually mess up and you can still solve any problem that you are given. Try to avoid doing things on the fly. Don't believe that you can hand wave an answer out of existence. There is a logical critical path that you can follow in order to derive an answer. And what's important is that you know how to set yourself up for that. Now, the fourth tip is to be open-minded and willing to learn. There are just some people who are so stubborn and they won't take your advice and completely refuse to change. Some of my clients are like this and why? You know, you're paying me to help you change and you won't even accept my advice. Maybe consciously, they do put their best efforts to apply whatever advice I'm giving them, but subconsciously, they're heavily resisting. I think a lot of people who come to me have this underlying and subconscious belief that there is nothing I can do. I think why people have this mindset is because they have already tried a lot of things, have a lot of misconceptions, and have made a lot of mistakes and built on top of those mistakes and bad habits that it truly prevents them from understanding what I am trying to say and convey. At that point, I usually have to beat down their assumptions and get them to rethink their fundamentals. This can often be the hardest part of coaching, but there's often a moment in my sessions where a client might feel absolutely beaten or broken down when their previous methods aren't working. But it's also at that moment when they are the most susceptible to my advice and ready to apply the change I recommend. A lot of these difficult clients, most of the session is really just being able to get them to that point. For instance, on my recent live stream, I had to get really tough on one of my clients because he did not make any progress from the previous week. 
I grilled him on his study habits and how he was practicing. Eventually, the problem came out that he would only study a topic for a few minutes at a time before moving on, that his practice and studying was inconsistent. I had to show him that his method of studying wasn't working, that the answer he gave to the problem of the previous week was no better than the problem that he came up with this week. You haven't really, like, to me, this says that there is no difference between what we did last week and what we did this week. And yeah, literally, there's no difference to me. This, so my question to you now is, how have you been practicing? Uh, I've just been doing uh, leak code problems that are in the uh, like realm of what I'm trying to learn, which is this. Okay, do you think back when you solve the problems on how you do it faster or what insights you needed? Because I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna guess no. Oh, oh. I think well, I think when I do the leak code problems, I can just end up, I, what I end up doing is just writing out the code so I can like lay out my thoughts in that way, and then it just makes more sense to me like that. Okay, so then I'm really trying to see like where I can help you because I believe the problem is actually in your practice. Like I, I, like a lot of the stuff that you're talking about should have been fixed when you started thinking about like how you do the problem faster. Uh, I think part of it too is just like I get distracted and. I'm not paying like full attention to the problem when I'm doing it. Yeah, because it should be, this should be like a 20-minute problem. And once my client finally realized that his study habits were actually the problem, I knew he was ready for change and that he was actually ready to receive help. Only then were we able to make actual significant progress. And while he didn't land an offer from Google in the next 10 days, he was actually able to get an offer from Amazon. And while a lot of problems and issues that we have in life may seem very easy to solve in hindsight, it often takes someone to really put you in that position to give you that vision and connect the dots for you. If you have given up in your mind and on yourself, then there's no advice in the world that I can give you in order to help you change. Nonetheless, I still believe myself as the agent of last resort, the break glass scenario, that if you cannot figure something out, if you cannot figure out how to pass your interviews, you come to me. And I firmly believe that I can help anyone achieve a Google offer given enough time. Now, my fifth tip is to have a good work-life balance. To prepare for interviews, there needs to be a lot of time spent on focusing or just practicing problems with no outside distractions. Of course, interviewing is just a part of getting a new job, but people have a life to live, you know, real responsibilities. They have a kid at home, they got a mortgage to pay. This may seem very unrelated, but learning how to balance your life responsibilities with programming is often one of the most neglected parts of preparing for the interview. For one, the sheer isolation of having to study and work all the time can get to a lot of people. Not everyone is built for strict isolation. In fact, one of my best clients with one of the best results that I've ever seen actually mentioned that having a nice support structure allowed her to focus on her studies and was one of the reasons why she was able to spend as much time as she did on her interview. She had friends who she could reach out for, for help and emotional support and actual support, who would often take care of some of the day-to-day -day chores for her so she could have more time to focus on studying. And I think my, my friends were really supportive throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. and they were really helping me just like focus on what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd made a study plan and I was really sticking to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really helped like pick up things like in the daily life that I, I, I that I didn't want to do anymore or didn't have time to do like, I don't know, walking the dog or like cooking or things like that. So I was really like not doing any of those things. Mm -hmm. and I was really just like focused on my, my study plan. Mm -hmm. But they really helped tell me like, oh, your study plan is, is a bit too intense. Just like cut down on this and then don't do this, take breaks between these things. Mm -hmm. So they really helped me like um, not overdo it, if that makes sense. No, that's um, Cause I was really like not taking any breaks, not going out. And then that was really bad. As a result, she got a very high L3 offer at Google. I don't recommend isolating or studying 24 seven either. Doing so can be mentally draining and can be counterintuitive. If you can, congratulations, you're a high functioning workaholic, but most people can't do that. On the other hand, if you spend all your time taking care of your life, then you really can't do much to progress your career. In contrast to my best client, one of my worst clients and failures actually had real life repeatedly interfere with coaching and plans. We only covered half the content we wanted to, and most of the time, he was very distracted and constantly jumping back and forth between his family, his H-1B visa lawyer, where he had to always be on call, and so on. As a result, he failed his Facebook interview and made very little progress in our practices. No matter what I can do for a person, if that person has some real life situation that prevents them from executing well on that advice, then there's very little that I can do to help them. I can always try to work around things, but if they consistently keep occurring and they consistently block our progress, then it's very difficult for me to actually create consistent and great results for them. Learning how to balance your own schedule is very, very important. And it's absolutely critical, not just to your interview, but also your career and what you do beyond that. So if you follow all these five tips, you will be well on your way to landing your coding interview. Of course, these aren't changes that can magically occur overnight. These are habits that you actually have to work on over time. And it doesn't actually take that long to actually do them. In fact, most people only need four to six weeks of coaching from me before they're actually ready for the on-site interview. But once you have learned the right habits, not only will they help you land your interview, but they will also help you succeed in your programming career long-term. A lot of the principles that I preach here and a lot of the principles that I tell my clients to follow often apply outside the coding interview as well. So. 
That'll do for me. If you have your own tips on how to land the coding interview, share them in the comments below. And if you would like one-on-one -on -one coaching for your upcoming coding interview, or just want some career advice, you can book me for coaching sessions at eChanTech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.